it's kind of cool how the sugar high experience kind of mirrors what sugar does within our body. Like there's that initial rush, there's that curiosity, there's almost that mania, there, there's a build towards something that is exciting and fun within our own bodies. And then it goes through the narrative to the point where you crash. And what that feeling of like, oh, we've all had it, where you're just cranky or you're tired or you're easily irritable or whatever that might be. The experience is different for everybody and that's part of what's exciting about it. Some people are gonna come through the door and be exposed to immersive art for the first time and see something cool and weird and colorful and that may be all they experience and that's great, that's fine. But there's a lot more substance there too if you look past that surface level and so the experience for some folks will be, oh, this is bright and colorful, and also, huh, this world's kind of bleak. And so what does that say about the art, and what does that say about our world today? The origin story of Sugar High is a group of people coming together and thinking, how can we do something super fun for our community? And Romy came to me and a few other people and said, hey, what if we do an immersive installation? And, and it really wasn't more than about a minute of thought to say, yeah, yeah, sure, great, let's do it. I'm a poet, so I always go to the serious side or the sinister side or the sad side, even of something full of candy and sugar and joy and things like that. But when Romy first approached me, she had some ideas about how the world got that way, like this world that they were creating, how did it get that way? When Sugar High announced that it was accepting applications for artwork, I immediately visualized myself as a hummingbird. And so as I was doing sketches, I just started imagining this story of Birdie Humming Rock, and she was the matriarch of Rock Candy Industries, and the piece just evolved from there. I think it's really important for us here in Enid with Sugar High to recognize that this work wouldn't even be possible if Factory Obscura had not paved the way for us and kind of demonstrated within the Oklahoma community that this is a not only highly sought after art form for people to experience, but also a sustainable art form for people to create. And I think that that cannot go unacknowledged. The idea of an immersive art in small towns in rural America and the collaboration involved, it was so good for me, but I think when people, especially young people, see everybody working together to create something so ginormous, it has nothing but good. It was, it was a wonderland. I mean, walking in there, it was just the variety and the imagination that every artist brought to the table to create all of the different sensory experiences and like every every element, every feeling, every everything. It was all there. It was all there and, and it was it was just like a wonderland. It was beautiful. Now that we've been done, that we've had several thousand people come through and show what it looks like today and, uh, and, and go through room by room. Let's go through room by room. So we'll start here in our lobby space with this great mural done by Tox Morello, one of the primary artists in the group who's worked with us doing three large murals for this installation and this masking tape piece done by Jess Petrus. This has also been kind of our counter where our staff's been hanging out and this is where people come in. We've kind of talked them through the basic. As you're going through, you can touch, you can interact, explaining immersive art. And, and so this is the, the starting point. And then it can take a couple different directions. So let's go this way next. Cool, let's go this way. <laughs> um, you step into this corridor here and we call it the bubble up corridor because there's kind of some recurring bubble themes. One of which being if you go in this direction, there is a giant pink super bubble out in the courtyard. Um, and then we've got the temple that has been created by Jaime. We've got the portrait, we've got the sunset and chonker. So there is this nice convergence of like, which direction do you go? So let's go first over here to the shrine that Jaime Rodriguez has done, who's here, who can tell us about his space and, and, and how it came to be. Hi, I'm Jamie, and this is my art installation here at Sugar High. Um, so what had inspired this area here um, was pretty much a more dark theme side of Sugar High. 
um, that kind of surrounded the idea of religion and kind of more spooky end of that. Everybody's so enthralled by sugar. Uh, but here it's more dark, macabre, um, the one candy goddess who rules them all. Um, and she will provide all your sugar needs. Uh, it was a long process to put this together, but in the end, uh, it came out beautiful with the dripping gum from the ceilings and the clouds and just a wonderful, magical, immersive experience uh, that you can come walk through, see this dark altar just full of um, little items and trinkets towards this place where you just worship and just become one with the space. And then across from Jaime's space, we have this portrait of Bertie Humming Rock. And this kind of evolved over time, this story of our world. So we're in the future, some vague point in the future, where we eat sugar and nothing else. And this is the, the portrait of the matriarch of the corporation that ruined our world. And so this ended up being a collaboration, this story between a lot of the artists in, uh, who worked on Sugar High, but particularly Kiona and Angie LaPaglia, who wrote the story, uh, who did a great poem for us, and Kiona, who did this portrait. This is the first entry in the Humming Rock Papers, which is the secret history of Sugar High. It's called, To the Victor Belongs the Truth. Some people say the first lie wins. Others say the best lie wins or the prettiest. From what I've seen, the lie that wins is the one that's easiest to sell. My family knew how to sell them all, and so they won. The power it takes to do something like that is hard for most people to fathom. The amount of money it takes is more than you'll see in 20 lifetimes. And the great irony is this, that fundamental to selling the lie is a profound understanding of the truth. Someone once said that the truth will lie in wait for all time. So I'm stashing a bunch of it here with a pathological hope that they were right. That truth is subversive and patient and nimble. Like the ant that has outlived ages of ice and giant lizards, wars and the idols of men. I'm Alethea Hummingrock and this is the truth. And then coming through here, we have a neon piece from Clint Shore uh, is it the construction, construction of, a of a sunset? And construction of a sunset is we, we built this whole room to fit Clint's space. And I think it ended up working out really well. And, and the colors, depending on what time of day you're in, it really does. I mean, it feels like a sunset now, but in the evening, the colors just are so vibrant and pop. And then sitting in front of it is a swing that I built. So you can sit here and, and enjoy the sunset and as often as that, facing the other direction, it's a great place for a selfie. And a lot of what we have done is intentionally done to provide lots of spots for pictures, for group pictures, for selfies, just to extend the fun past your time in the installation itself. We live in a selfie culture. That's right. We've which created is, lots of selfie stations. And which is heightened even further in our sugar high world where we're all driven by instant gratification and overstimulation. Selfies are clearly part of that. Yeah. So coming through here, these are chonkers. Romy did the chonkers. I did do the chonkers. Um, I worked on chonkers with a bunch of volunteers from all over the state. And chonkers in the sugar high world is our largest, most important candy because you know, if you're eating sugar all the time and it's just like your obsession, your addiction, what you need, it's burning off so quickly that you're having to eat all the time. Chonkers kind of solves this problem for people who don't want to eat all the time or really need a cost-effective way to get calories. There are over 700 little nibs on each of these chonkers and one has enough calories for an entire day. So that's kind of nice because it's like, well, you don't have to worry about the chewing or the taste or anything. It's just instant gratification. Kind of cool. And then over here in the corner, we have our donation of used candy spot. To help the struggling children, to help needy children, you can donate your gently used candy. And as you can see, lots of folks have. It's disgusting. The number of times we got asked, is that for real, baffled me. That this is clearly, I mean, it's disgusting. 
But a lot of folks seem to think there was some merit in that and that like, oh, do, I mean, what are you going to do with this when it's over? How are you going to donate this? And we just, no, 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 listen, this is a joke. This is not real. Don't eat this. It's disgusting. And then coming through here, this is our sugar detector. So if you live in a world where we eat nothing but sugar, it's really important to know if you have enough sugar and, you know, getting, pricking your finger and checking your blood, that's, that's too cumbersome. So this is a sugar detector. And if anything on you glows, you have enough sugar. Uh, there's the explanation there and, and everyone passes through these and everybody looks down and notices what glows and, and what doesn't. And the flecks of paint I have my arm hair are really fluorescing nicely. <laughs> and then you can peek into a miniature world. Ants are a through line in our story. And so you can see here the miniature world that Romy created in two little peepholes to get a peek into the, the world that they live in. I thought that if I came over here, that would be a... Yeah. But it's not the visible peephole, but I will show you this peephole. Yeah, though neither peephole uh, really comes through on camera. There are some things that that are kind of fun in part because you have to see it in person. It's nice the ants live in there, and we really... We don't want to bother the ants. Like, they do... They've got their lives, but we do need to check in on them from time to time and make sure they have all their needs met. They're doing good right now. Underneath... The miniature world is a space done by Lynn Northcutt that's a quiet place. It's a place of refuge. That if everything is overstimulation, I knew that some folks would need a place to be able to get away from it. And so Lynn Northcutt did this great space that is that really is an escape. And it and it got used a lot. Oh. There were always people just kind of hanging out in there. Right, the panic room. I mean, it's so interesting to think about how a 13-year-old is going to... Uh, interpret an idea and the idea of overstimulation this 13 year old was just like well, let's make the the place where you can go that is not all the mania all the time and created a panic room as a result i love this room so much we're so lucky to have a coloring book room twilene made this room um so that people <laughs> So that people could have the opportunity for coloring book walls. Not everybody gets that and they're, you know, like that's a pretty rare experience to be given permission to, yeah. to do that. So would you tell us about Goblin Boogie and what inspired kind of the theme or the direction of your art? Okay, well originally I was thinking that I was going to write a story and it was going to be complicated. I was going to have all these characters, but um, I was making it way too complicated in my head and then one day I was listening to some pop music and I was dancing and I thought I should just draw people dancing and I thought that was boring so I drew goblins instead and um, they're all self-portraits every single one of them is uh, me dancing I would get up and I'd do the moves and then I'd draw it and there they are they're so endearing and even as simple line drawings are not simple but as line drawings they're so emotive and they're so expressive and it's so nice to see the ways in which people have embraced it collaborated like we've got lots of really kind of keen moments where there's one goblin and then we've got uh, a friend just right you know just right behind just hanging out or <clears throat> the number of heads that kind of pop up in mm -hmm. these random places like it's definitely more chaotic than I anticipated, but it's also like, wow, six weeks of freedom with crayons and this is what happens. And the content really did grow. I mean, some of these, some of the additions are just exist on their own, but I love those, like Romy indicated, where it is somebody's added something and then, or somebody's drawn a, a person and then over time, like the hairs become more complicated and more elaborate and that people really are adding on or, one of the folks we had working for us, whenever it was quiet, she'd come through and just add an ant somewhere. And she just drew an ant. And so there are lots of these little ants that just got added whenever, you know, there was a time to kill. Oh, I just need to do another ant. And I did not know that. Yeah, and, that. and there's a lot here. It really is. It's, it's not a big room until you start thinking about how many square feet of wall and good mm -hmm. grief. This is a lot of content. Mm -hmm. and, and it really did evolve over the course of the installation in a way that I think I'm really happy about. I've got no complaints. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Twilene. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Twilene. The coloring book room came with, like we, Ben made this really beautiful crayon cradle so that there'd be a, a good place for people to put stuff, which is kind of nice. 
craftsmanship. And then coming around this corner, this is, is what we kind of called our hub space. It's another traffic point where you can go a couple different directions. And so the, the central focal point of the room is another piece from Tox, this giant ant in this that occupies, I think, this kind of like menacing and friendly space. And that our story, the idea is that ants are important. They're part of our built infrastructure. They clean up the mess from all these people eating nothing but sugar. But ants are a little, also a little bit menacing. And when we were talking about this piece, when Tox was working on it, it was really an example of, okay, how can I straddle that line? And I think the touch point a lot of people have, have, have found with this is the, the ant and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It's so much like a part of my childhood and a lot of other people's that there is this friendly ant that's also terrifying, but, but still being friendly. And I think he did a great job capturing that and also including elements that are present in the rest of the installation. The candy cap mushrooms, the neon is an element that, that has been repeated a couple different times. And I think Tox did a really lovely job uh, creating this big focal point piece in here. Indeed. Nice architectural details when this was um, being developed, when the space was happening and Ben was working on construction, like he was able to create some angular things to create visual interest and to heighten what Tox has created in terms of three dimension. There are two other components that are in this room uh, that leads into two other areas. We've got the history of sugar. It is an incomplete history of sugar, but it is an accurate history of sugar up to the 2000s. It stops in the 2000s though, because at the point at which society became addicted to sugar, no one is tracking time anymore. That is no longer the priority. So there may be this mythology of history, of our recent history as a sugar high society, but it stops as a written form in the early 2000s. So there's that for the thing that, the people who have most, I think, appreciated and genuinely spent the time with this very uh, cumbersome piece are older men because it's history and it's accurate. So I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, and then in the hub, we share uh, the space with the screen that is showing nothing but a four minute animation by Nathan Guidry. It is endearing and hilarious and so well made and so delightful and warrants a lot of attention. Welcome to another episode of One Sentence Movie Reviews. It was okay. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of One Sentence Movie Reviews. From the makers of Balloon Cat comes... Balloon Chicken! Factory Punch! Need a bit more pip in your pep? A bit more stip in your step? Then look no further than... Olfactory Punch! Olfactory Punch is not responsible for any medical repercussions or injury. <coughs> Balloon Cat is over! Gather up all your balloon cat stuff and throw it in the trash. Because Balloon Chicken is here, and he's here to stay. Balloon chicken is a soulless cash grab. It's a scam. You know, I really wish they'd go back to making things like Balloon Cat. That's when they actually cared.
Watch this. Please don't skip this video. You have to listen to me. Don't eat the sugar. From the makers of Fluffle Puffball Jr. Comes Double Fluffle Puffball Max. Eat it twice. I just got my Double Fluffle Puffball in the mail, and it's the best thing I've ever had. And I would never lie. Ever. Ever. Never. Ever. Ne never. Double Fluffle Puffball Max. Eat it twice. <coughs> Has this ever happened to you? You feel lost, confused, hungry. Grab Chonker and never be hungry again. Maybe. One of the cool things after Nathan was able to finish his animation is that we were able to take some of the content from his animation and put it in the bodega, which is the next space we're gonna go into. So this is our bodega space that, that I conceived of as, as part of living in the world. That if we're telling a story, we wanna show an example of what it's like to live in the world. And that we talked about a couple different ideas and played with the idea of a, a living space, but I think a convenience store, a bodega, gave us more room to, uh, to play with some of the ideas that we'd really enjoyed. So the idea is this, is this is that convenience store in this world where everything's sugar. So all these elements, all, these, all this packaging, all these products were done by Corey Keller did quite a bit of them. Aunt Braggs did a hilarious infomercial for a product for a fake at-home cavity repair kit that she actually created. Uh, Have you become familiar with a storefront like this? Attempting to keep up with your dental decay on a regular basis and having to visit the dentist office almost every single week? Aren't you tired of doing this? Well, that looks like a yes to me. Very tired indeed. Or are you exhausted every day because over in the night you get woken up? multiple times a night, multiple times a week, due to dental pain, due to dental trauma, and due to dental decay. This has got to be wearing on you. This girl has nothing left to give. Or one of the worst circumstances, you've had a hot date and you're ready to seal the deal. The chemistry is right, and just before you go in for a kiss, she stops and notices something. Oh my God, is that a tooth on your lip? It happens to the best of us, and we're sorry that it just happened to you, my dude. Totally embarrassed. Introducing Pearly Whites, your new go-to at home cavity filler express. No more embarrassing moments and no more extreme life interruptions. We've got you covered. Here's a quick word from our general manager as she discusses the benefits of this new product. Hi. I'm Anj, the general manager of Pearly Whites Incorporated, here to talk to you about this awesome new product. Hey, but don't let this get up fool you. I'm an expert. We all remember the days where our teeth were white and pearly. Sheesh, that was years ago for most of us. Now you spend exuberant, out-of-pocket expenses for the dental appointments that you need on a weekly basis. Here at Pearly Whites Incorporated, we say no more. We're here to help you out. Now you can do it yourself for only 10 easy payments of $19.99. Here's one of our satisfied customers receiving her package in the mail. Wow, we're so happy for you. So, what's in the box? 
a jar of liquid magic scientifically proven to work. A sculpting tool to shape your new feelings and scrape out the old. A dental syringe to fill your previous cavity. A curing light. No, it's not a regular flashlight. Get all of this for only nineteen ninety nine, And yes, we will bill you for 10 months. Let's watch as one of our satisfied customers demonstrates the product. All right, pearly whites, here we go. Okay, first off with the pick. Uh-oh. Okay, that's all right because that's supposed to happen. Let's get a little bit of this action, whatever this is. Oh yes, it's pearly white. Is this paint? Is this literally liquid magic? Can I have some water please? Water. <laughs> Y'all are not paying me enough to put liquid magic in my mouth. Okay, and now we sculpt. Yes. And now we cure. Perfection. Wow, she's looking better already. But wait! If you call now, you can get a dental case, which can really save you in a pinch. Luckily, our sad boy from earlier had one in his pocket, so the night wasn't ruined. He was able to continue on into a fantastic evening thanks to Pearly Whites. Now that's what we call success. Call now. 784-277-8427. This product has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and should not be used if you consider yourself to be an intelligent person. We live in a free country. You are allowed to use this product at your own risk. Pearly Whites and its affiliates will not be held responsible for any harm this product may cause you if ingested. Remember this before you try and call in a plane or get your money back. No money back guarantee. Take control of your dental health today. And remember, the clock is ticking. <laughs> Uh, I took some of Nathan's uh, ideas from the commercials in his video and made the actual packaging to go with it. So we have the balloon chicken and the balloon cat on clearance from Nathan's video. And then we have a case of, of lots of fake candies. Some of them are, are real candies repurposed. Some of them are epoxy things that Romy made. And we crowdsourced early on names of fake candies. Chonkers came from, from that crowdsourced list of fake candies. And so the idea is this is full of, of what you'd find, again, in a convenience store. But all these fake candies with hilarious names give us something else to dive into and folks seem to really enjoy just looking at every single one of them and kind of making guesses about some of it and and i think we did we did a nice job of, of creating some more content there for people to dive into over time and that's been really fun along with the things like the fresh produce that are these wonderfully delightful fruit flavored cysts that that they're real candy i don't love them but they're real candy uh, but people people have uh, clearly let me put it this way, we had to replace a lot of them. And, and I hope people have enjoyed their food flavored cysts. So gross. <laughs> oh, importantly in here, this is a company store. This is the company store for Rock Candy Industries mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm repping the t-shirt, we have the logo behind me, that Rock Candy Industries is the corporation that owns everything, runs everything and, and ruined our world. So we wanna make sure this be representation of that space. Right. Um, the final component of the bodega is the sugar zap. Sugar zap is another way in which we use light in the sugar high world to um, give people their sugar, meet their sugar needs. Oh. <laughs> it just talked to me. Yeah. So it's still talking. So sorry to not talk over it. Um, I'm going to demonstrate this for you, even though it, it is um, wholly creepy and weird.
<laughs> yeah, it is creepy. And, and I hope it doesn't uh, mess with the audio way too much. But just sit down, close the door, and hit the green button. Uh, uh. <laughs> Welcome to the sugar zap. It vibrates your nose so hard. And it's this such is such an experience. And this is a steam cabinet I found at a at a thrift store and uh, and gutted everything out of it and replaced it with a an industrial concrete vibrator and strobe lights. So when you do, you sit down. There is a message. There are directions. You know, sit down, close the door, and press the green button and get your sugar through your skin. And it just cracks everybody up. It's been really fun. Shall we go this way, kids? I think so. You want to go into the disco? Let's go up into the disco space, disco lemonade, which without the without the music on, it's only a piece of it. Certainly, I'll take a minute here to say that we we had music done by Riley Jansen, who created some great music, original music for the whole space in five different zones. And it's not one repeating track; it's elements that that jump and come together. So it's it's repetitive in that you hear the same elements, but it's not linear and there's some little Easter eggs that get thrown throughout, but it all works together. So when you are hearing the, the thumping bass from our dance party space adjacent to the, you know, the bodega, it's not dissonant, it, it, it works together, and that I think he did really well. But in this space, we wanted to show an example of overstimulation, and it is all overstimulation. It's flashing lights, it's loud music, it's three of our ant friends done by Nick Bayer, the ants love the overstimulation. They hang out in here, and Nick Bayer sculpted six of these giant ants, three of which live in here on the walls and the floor. And uh, and it really is the point is to draw the contrast of how much overstimulation can we fit in one weirdly shaped small room. So as we all know, ants are drawn to sugar, and um, ants became a huge part of Sugar High from. Um, from many different artists, and so I decided to incorporate them into the Humming Rock Papers. This entry is called The Ants Go Marching. I can't remember who it was that said, ants are so much like humans, it's almost embarrassing. They create societal structures, wage war, collaborate, farm. They're also survivors. So savvy that for 160 million years, they dodged everything from asteroids to ice ages. But they couldn't dodge Birdie. By the time everything went down, she'd already bought up the vast majority of traditional sugar-producing land on the planet, which meant she got to vote on which populations got allocations of what was now the most valuable agricultural product on the planet. And which ones didn't? The poor countries didn't. With their population suffering and dying from the sugar shortages at rates you can't even imagine, the scrappy nations got creative. They started refining sugar in secret from things like native fruit and coconut trees, watermelons and gourds, macadamia nuts, legumes, clover, anything that showed a decent yield, and they hid it. But Bertie has eyes everywhere. She knew what they were doing. She just couldn't find the sugar. Her first call was to her friends at the Pentagon, who spent millions engineering drones into flying robotic ants, tagged to detect the chemical compounds of glucose and sucrose. The idea was to find the hidden stores they knew existed, steal them, monetize them, and leave the poor black and brown nations to their fate. Turns out they couldn't out-engineer nature. So, Birdie called on the congressional committee she'd purchased to earmark billions toward the genetic engineering of ants. After that, the poor countries who had gone underground with their secret sugar stores had nowhere to hide. The US Army ants sniffed them out. And today, there are vast portions of entire continents free of human population, which if you're reading this, you already know. And anyway, whoever said ants are just like us are wrong. They'll be here when we're gone. The Chaco Canyon is, you know, exactly what it says. It is a chocolate themed canyon. It is the lowest point in Sugar High. You want to come in? Um, we have a few features in here. Uh, not only the canyon walls, we've got this really beautiful um, candy cap mushroom sculpture made by Nick Bear. 
uh, candy cap mushrooms naturally scenting the air with a butterscotch scent that permeates throughout, but um, they're dreamy and lovely and totally want me to shrink down or get big, I think. They're very, <laughs> they're very Alice in Wonderland. Um, and then we've got a licorice, licorice falls over here, the red licorice falls um, that have been fun to play with. Because we do have this very specific area dedicated just to chocolate, it's really important to acknowledge that chocolate is a special, special treat in the sugar high world. Like it's got calories that are not purely sugar. And so it is eaten in extreme moderation. However, it is easy in sugar high world to OD on chocolate because it's not something we need for nutritional and we love it so much that we can just eat like maniacs. So we do have an emergency uh, catch-all here. The emergent suite is a, an emergency aid for people who might overdose on chocolate and need some pure sugar stat. That is exactly what that's for. We also have in here the exit to our slide and, and we'll walk through that in a little bit, but there is a, there's a great slide transitioning from the hub space down to here that was done by Chris Bodell and Enid Artist. And it's another kind of an example of overstimulation and, and mm -hmm. we'll look at it from the other end, but this is where it comes out. And it also, I think, creates a great contrast as you're going from the hub space into here, there's such, there's such a distinct difference. Mm -hmm. And that transition space does, as you come down to this dark room from that bright, louder, more colorful space, does create, I think, a kind of a, that, that where you stand up and have to blink moment. That's been really fun watching people when you come down here and see somebody come down in here for the first time, there's always that, oh, oh, okay. And that's been really fun watching that over and over again. It's awesome. So we can go out this way now. This space. This is our crash space in that we wanted to demonstrate and, and physically show how you, you can't ride the sugar high forever. My mom keeps reiterating that a sugar crash isn't real, that this is not a thing that really happens. It's an urban legend, but it's still funny. And I think it still works for our purpose. Had another friend who's a dog go, you know, that doesn't really happen. I was like, I don't care. It's, just, it's a story. Don't, don't worry about it. Right. But so we have this projector projecting this field of static. We have a parabolic reflector speaker projecting this horrible dissonant sound. And this target challenging you to stand here for 42 seconds to be cleansed. And it's hard to do. And you really do walk out of here with that discomfort and that feeling of, of, of a hangover or that, that ick, the whole thing's icky. Mm -hmm. And while you're getting stared at by another one of Nick's aunts, and then this wall of these slowly rotating, unsettling googly eyes on these discs. And, and Romy did the discs and I did the motors and, and, it, and it really does, the longer you look at it, it's unsettling. The pupils shift. There's some of that chaotic motion that, uh, that's kind of, it, it, the whole thing's unsettling. But, but there's an emergency stop and you can press the emergency stop for a break. But that's the trade-off. And then it all just starts spinning again, that it's inescapable. And, uh, and everyone eventually comes through here, that no matter what direction you go, you will mm -hmm. come through the crash space. To the soapbox, which is kind of fun, bubble theme, kind of the culmination of everything. We envision the soapbox being kind of like, at the end of it all, what do you get to take with you? What are you leaving? The soapbox is a place where you can speak your mind. There is no ramification. There is no consequence. You've got something to say. This is the place to say it. You've got this really great dragon companion uh, over your shoulder that is making sure that everything is good and they've got your back and you can say your piece to the world, which people have. And it's been really interesting to see that. The only prompt we have up here is use this soapbox. Please share your thoughts on how we came to be like this. And it's broad enough and open-ended enough that it's got a lot of use in all these different ways. And people really have stood up here and ranted and mm -hmm. it's been hilarious. On the other side of this space, we have these 12 panels. Tox also did these. They're painted on both sides. So you can see it from inside or outside. And it is such a rich painting. There's so much in here. There are so many details. 
and it's one of those spots that you kind of walk past. Oh, it's pretty. It's a bird. It's a skull. But the more you look at it, there is so much depth here. He did a really spectacular job, and it's it's been fun watching people just slowly walk past and finding more and more little details and. And it's, it's really added to the space and also helped us kind of constrain it and define this end. As we have these great big windows, we still want the light through, we still want people to see through, but this gives it kind of some definite shape and space. And mm -hmm. I think it all came together really well. Yeah, that acknowledgement of like, what is outside is a bit different. This does a really great job of giving us that. Um, the final pieces in here involve kind of that continuation of theme of soapbox. So we've got a Candy Chang chalkboard here. Candy Chang uh, is a very famous international artist who created the Before I Die uh, project. And it, has, it was so successful in her first approach with it that ultimately she made it open source and said, you can do this too. People and communities love it. We have gotten tremendous response to this where people just get to respond to the prompt. Before I die, dot, 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 what would I do? And there have been some really beautiful, beautiful comments left. Mm -hmm. So kind of nice to have that introspective moment at the end of all of the mania. Like, what do you want to do before you die? Tell us. Let's see if you do it. I hope you do. This circles back to the hub. So we just made a nice big circle. And this is also a, an area that it's amazing how many people have missed this. But once it's found, um, it's just over and over and over. It is the ant tunnel. There we go. And it leads down into the Chaco Canyon. Chris Bodell made this in the archway that goes between the two. But it is a fun slide. Uh, kids certainly have loved it over and over. But I would be lying if I didn't say that some of our um, more maybe long in the tooth uh, visitors have enjoyed it just as much. It's really been a great asset that uh, got lots punished. Of, lots of punishment. It's been punished. For it's sure. Been, it has. Oh, we also can't miss Angela Paglia did a great oh, poem for you. us that's been playing on a loop here on this screen. We also had this online before we opened, and it is excerpted on either exit door down through here. Beautiful poem. And Angie also did part of the backstory for us, working with Kiona, creating this story from the perspective of a disaffected granddaughter of this corporate matriarch. And Angie told a great story, and also it's a really compelling poem that it's been fun just hearing this, hearing her voice so much in this space. Right. When people walk into Sugar High in Enid, Oklahoma later this spring, it's gonna be amazing. Sugar High was inspired by sweet things, but on a deeper level, it was also inspired by this society's cravings for on-demand satisfaction. And some of that is due to amazing technology, but I also think that there's a cost associated with that. And I've been thinking about that cost and kind of grieving that loss, and um, I wrote a poem. It's called Sweet and Low. Hey you, with the wash and wear tattoo, hanging out on the line like a you do you as long as I get mine, piss stain scene of the crime clue from that one time, that one time you scrolled through, strolled through, hit up the drive through once upon a non-renewable night when you strip mine time with sugar and a lime twist you might have missed the truth. You might have. Anyway, I just wanted to say, that next day, plug and play, DoorDash, Mishmash, NFT, look at me, like, 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 drop the mic mentality will not hold. We divide because we cannot conquer the cold. And then we're old. And we tell ourselves, hey, hi, in the sweet by and by. We still got the stars, man. We still got the scars, man. In a gumball moon, we can eat with a spoon. And it's sweet, man. It's sweet. Ain't it? And then we're back through here to the hub. We'll also mention the geodesic dome outside can be a reach with this door. People have been going in and out sit outside underneath the dome when the weather's nice. There have been so many chalk drawings. We've gone through huge amounts of chalk and, and it's been a great just hangout spot for people over time. 
All right. I mean, we have concluded the tour of Sugar High. But then we're back here to the hub. And, yeah. and this is the, again, as we don't have a linear traffic direction, people loop around a couple times. Mm -hmm. And every, every time you enter a room from a different angle, you see it differently. And that's also been interesting, I think, given what is not that big a space, a lot more life and, and make it able to be experienced these different ways that every direction you go, you're gonna see it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And then we're back up here. Yep. Here we are. Back at the front. Back to the lounge. Back to the origin. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs>